Thank you for joining us for the Literary Southwest event, An Evening with Tara Eason and Lorraine Herring, held here at the Boyd Tenney Library at Yavapai College. Please click on the survey linked in the description below in order to tell us your thoughts on how the event went. Go to the Literary Southwest website in order to sign up for our e-newsletter to receive updates on future author talks and to find out how you can continue to support one of Northern Arizona longest running literary events. Have a wonderful evening and happy reading. So welcome to the Literary Southwest, an evening with Tara Eisen and Lorraine Herring. My name is Justaza and I am the program director for the Literary Southwest, which is one of the longest running literary events in Northern Arizona. So before we start, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping rules. First, you probably heard this before. Please make sure your cell phones are set to silent. Vibrate is excellent. You can still text people of the amazing things that you're hearing here today, but silently. <laughs> Second, for everyone who's attending in person, on your seats, there is a Q&A slip. And that you're going to be able to use to write your questions that you have for the authors. Please include which author this question is directed to on the slip. <laughs> and also, when it's time for the Q&A, the staff will go around the room and they'll be able to collect your questions to be read. For those of you who are tuning in online, simply write your questions inside of the chat. We also have a survey that is placed on the chairs and it's also available for you online in the YouTube description. So please fill them out so we can understand how we can improve the event. And also, if you want to suggest future authors for the series. I know you can do that. Isn't that amazing? It's like, who will we get? Who? <laughs> and also, fourth but not last, we have all of the authors' book for sale back there being sold by the awesome YC Bookstore. So when we are ready for the book signing, feel free to pop over there and grab your copy. So now, I'm going to introduce our amazing guest today, and I'm going to try to give all of the words right this time. So, Tara Eisen is the author of three novels, A Child Out of Alcatraz, The List, and Rockaway, the short story collection, Bull, and the essay collection, Reeling Through Life, How I Learned to Live, Love, and Die at the Movies. Her new novel, at the hour between dog and wolf is set in World War II France. In another life, she was the co-writer for the cult classic Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, which I love that <laughs> Oh my god, the movie was fantastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when I saw that, I'm like, ah! <laughs> okay. Done, fan. So, Lorraine Herring holds an MFA in creative writing and an MA in counseling and psychology. She's an author, illustrator, book coach, grief counselor. What just don't you do? Math. <laughs> yeah, math yeah. In addition to teaching psychology full-time at Yavapai College, her books include Lost Fathers, How Women Can Heal from Adolescent Father Loss, Writing Begins with the Breath, Embodying Your Authentic Voice, The Writing Warrior, On Being Stuck, Tapping Into the Creative Power of the Writer's Block, Gathering Lights, A Novel of San Francisco, The Grief Force, we have it back there, a book about what we don't talk about and a constellation of ghosts, a speculative memoir with ravens. She is also the founder of Hags on Fire, a zine for women writing about menopause. Our host this evening is the amazing Laura Klein. She is a member of the English faculty at Young Fight College and the Writer's Read Coordinator. She has been at the college for 14 years and loves to curl up with a good book. Please join me in welcoming them. Well, hello everyone. So those were very enthusiastic <laughs> introductions. So I don't think we need to introduce ourselves, but I would, you two are both planning to read a little bit from your work. So if you could just tell us a little bit about the book that you're reading from and then read from it. And we'll start right here with Lorraine. Okay. So the book I'm gonna read from is my latest. It's a constellation of ghosts, um, a speculative memoir with ravens. Um, this came out during the pandemic. So it was a super fun pandemic launch book. 
um, <laughs> came out in 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, the premise of this book is I was, um, I was busy doing other things when cancer came and my father returned to me as a raven. So my dad, had, he died in 1987. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2017. And this book is a, is a memoir that weaves together the unresolved grief from that, um, the changes that cancer um, you know, brought into my life and um, other sorts of magical woo -woo kinds of things. So, do you want me to read? And now or I've heard. Yeah. Okay, I'll read now. <laughs> I'm going to read now because Laura told me to. So I'm going to read about six pages. I'm going to read from the very, very beginning. The book is divided into um, what I call like the real, the which is a lyric, lyrical essays, and then the speculative, which is formatted as a stage play. And that's I'm going to read a little bit from each section. So it starts off with um, with the lyric essay. Words were your superpower. They helped you make sense of everything. But now, multisyllabic words from a different vocabulary circle the sounds you understand. Vultures waiting to devour the corpse of your useless language. These new combinations of letters, cytotoxin, angiogenesis, immunohistiology, swallow the words you are familiar with in large gulps. You begin to detach from yourself. The white walls of the gastroenterologist's office collapse like a file box into black velvet corridors. You see your husband, but he can no longer see you. Your feet have been pulled to the velvet, your body stretched rubber, words bouncing off your skin. Cancer, referral, stage, malignant, surgery, now. Next, the corridors unfold into a labyrinth of rooms, stairs, doors, all brushed black velvet, devoid of sound. Your gastroenterologist is talking to you and your husband is touching your hand, but you've left them. Their mouths are moving, but the language is garbled, the bubbles of fish underwater. Without the ability to understand, you reach your hands to the walls, soft and thick and sticky. Each step pulls your enlarged body forward. The floor is a conveyor, doing what it must. Once you've arrived fully in the velvet underground, new walls erect around you. The white drywall adorned with gold embossed diplomas disappears into the black fabric and the world where you came from is shut behind clear glass. You realize you've left your clothes, but it's too late. Your stretched rubber body bounces slowly floor to ceiling, wall to wall, your pale skin naked and electric against the dark. Your doctor gives your husband a referral to a colorectal surgeon and turns back to his computer. A shadow you remains seated in the office calmly writing down the next steps before gathering her belongings to leave. Shadow you is making lists. Talk to your dean, find a cat sitter, tell mom, find substitutes for classes, fill out FMLA paperwork, tell. And you realize shadow you is doing the same thing you did when you were seven and your father had a heart attack and all the grown-ups thought he would die within a year even though they never told you that. They told you everything was fine but your eyes saw their lies. Cleaved in half, his chest scarred, his daddiness had disintegrated into bruised cells. You broke apart then, a seven-year-old fragment watching a seven-year-old shadow self making the lists that she believed would save her. Tell extended family, write eulogy for dad, take care of mom, cry all the tears out now. It didn't work then, your tears still swim behind the decades of fine, but nonetheless, Shadow you makes the lists that will overcome this crisis. Prep classes for two months, set up auto pay for credit cards, find proxies for your committees, update your will. You wonder if that girl fragment and her girl shadow ever found their way back together again, but there are now more pressing matters, such as learning new vocabulary words and finding the key and the door to leave this black velvet place. The dark labyrinth stretches behind you and the double-paned sheet of glass in front of you is smooth. Shadow you is smiling, saying something to the doctor, cracking a joke perhaps, and your husband has retreated to his brain to figure out how to fix the rebellion of your colon cells. Shadow you leaves the office, credit card in hand, to pay for services rendered in codes. You don't know the language of codes yet, of billing and declining and remanding, but you will. Shadow you has a string tied to her wrists that reminds you of the friendship bracelets you would make in the backyard of your North Carolina home before your father got sick, before you moved to Arizona, before he died, before you shattered and the abuser got in, before cancer. But upon closer look, 
The shimmering string stretches, a connective thread from her body to you in your strange velvet box, and Shadow You is pulling you and your new house behind her like a carnival balloon. You press your face to the glass, but it distorts, and the waiting room, and then the parking lot, and then your red Toyota constrict and slip farther away. Shadow You calls your dean, makes an appointment, checks an item off the list. You've been leaning on the glass, and when you back away, the imprint of your forearms forms a key. A raven appears between the panes, right leg shorter than the left, a lit Pall Mall cigarette clipped in its beak. You rub your eyes. Shadow you in the passenger seat of your car is now a brush stroke in an impressionist landscape. The raven, blue, black, and iridescent, grinds its cigarette out beneath its claw and uses its beak to tap along the inside of the glass, edging your arm prints with its tick, tick, ticks. When it finishes, it pushes the cut piece of glass toward you, and you jump back as it lands silently on the velvet. The raven cocks its head, its right eye finding yours, and winks as it steps through the keyhole, turns back for the dead cigarette, and then hops to your bare feet. You reach your hand through the hole and touch the exterior pane, the world on the other side of it increasingly unfamiliar. You retreat, and the raven fans its wings and leaps to your shoulder, and its cool breath raises the hair on your still naked. You have no words for this. And then the next short section is in the voice of um, the raven, which is the voice of my dad. I remember you, my daughter, before you were you. I watched you grow beneath my wife's belly, felt your feet kicking the walls of her womb. Always running you were, always trying to get out, get away, but when you were born, you wouldn't walk. Not for three years. You sat and you crawled and you watched, and then one day you got up and walked into the next room and closed the door. That was you. And that was you in relationship to us, to your mother and me. We could come close, but not too close. We could watch you watching us from your playpen, but from the very beginning, you were a closed book. And I knew then what I know now, you had taken on a burden that wasn't yours. You would come into the world not just with her eyes and jaw and my love of language and history, but you came with the ghosts that made us us. Had we known creating a child forged a link not just to the best of us, but to the parts of us we wanted desperately to erase, would we have made you? Would we have anchored another soul with our ghosts? Maybe that is all human creation is, a stringing together of ghosts born from one flicker of love, one sigh of release, a way of tethering us all together so that we don't get lost in the dark. You'd think I'd know these things now that I am here. I remember you watching me when I was dying. I was back in the hospital and I was in that damned pastel gown with the snaps and I wasn't conscious, but I had never been more awake. You wonder about these things now that you have been in the hospital. I watch you, I watch you, you, I watch. You know you're close. When you feel both limp and living, your body is asleep, but you, you begin to crackle and unfold, and you never realized how big you were, how much space you could have taken up, how much of yourself you could have shared. I wanted to reach to you, but my arms were shackled to the bed because I had tried in the night, unconscious though I was, yes I was, but still, the part of me that transcends me had tried to untangle myself from this body to remove the tubes and needles and silence the relentlessly squawking machines. When you are about to burst with breadth and depth, you know it will only be a few moments and you want to resist like how you, daughter, wanted to resist the anesthesia before surgery, but always it is stronger. It is a tidal wave at the edge of your consciousness and you surrender to it without trying to, even if for a moment you plan to anchor your defiant feet in the shifting sand. I wanted to reach to you, but we had not been a tactile family. Too much Lutheran, too much Baptist, too much discomfort with the messiness of flesh. But I knew in that final dermal moment that to touch the skin of another was to touch the face of God I had long wrestled with. To touch the flesh of another was to hold the very miracle of the cosmos, that 98.6 degree fire threading through us all. I wanted you to touch me too, but I knew the beeping scared you, the thick restraints on my wrists, the unconscious thrashing of my body that was trying to kick loose my soul. I was breaking free of my bone cage at the same time I was reaching for you and the full moon tide was coming and I could taste the salt spray on my lips 
and she smelled of life, and my body twisted, and I tugged at my chains like a Victorian ghost, but they were not chains at all, only flaccid representations of the human hope of permanence. The nurse had brought you into my room that morning alone. You were alone, only 19, 19, only alone. And she told you I was leaving, and you watched like you had watched me from the moment you opened your eyes from your curl in the crib to your petulant high school pout to this instant where we found ourselves on opposite sides of the river. I watched your birth passage thrashing and bloody and dark, and you watched my death slide, and I wondered for a blink who was waiting for me to emerge, flesh suit shed, shimmering sparkle of dust, and I wanted to bring you with me, not to take your life from you, no, 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 but to take my very best thing with me, my daughter, my daughter, I wish so much I could have stayed, stayed, could have saved you. So I struck a bargain like Robert Johnson, song and guitar at the Delta Crossroads, just a little bit more time, just a little bit, you see, my daughter, my daughter, she will need me soon, but the full moon tide kept rising. It's heard this song before, so much before that it has a response. Can I get an amen, amen, can I get an amen? Who wants to be saved? I do, I do. Who wants to turn it over now? I do, I do. The tide is rising, the salt is churning, the undertow has wrapped its fingers around me, and I have one second left to memorize your face. No lines yet, no lines, no gray, and I watch you swallow my tide, lapping at the muggy air in the sterile room, gulping your own rising tide back, squeezing your eyes closed to hold the water line at bay. You are watching me, still tossing on the bed. You are watching me, slipping out behind my lips into the fluorescent room. You are watching me, last gasp, death, rattle, death, rattle, only the shaking off of the lost tendons that held me to my house, my house, my lungs, my spleen, my liver, my kidneys, my useless leg, my heart, my heart, my heart, how well you have done for all you have suffered through, how well you have done. My daughter, my daughter, drink me in this moment, our moment, please, please, just a little more time. I come to the crossroads. I come, I come. Stopped breathing. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> wow. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here with Laura and Lorraine. Um, and thank you all for coming. And thank you, uh, Estaza, for, for having me. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little wrecked. Um, OK, so my new book is called At the Hour Between Dog and Wolf. And as Estaza said, it's a novel set in World War II France. And it was inspired by my stepmother, who was a hidden child in World War II, a little Jewish girl in Hungary who uh, was sent to live in hiding with a Catholic family out on a farm and told, OK, you have to be a little Catholic girl now. And she was given a new name and taught the Catholic prayers and warned not to mis make a mistake. And she doesn't remember a lot of it. She was only five. She made it through the war OK. <clears throat> But um, what she does remember very clearly is being told, um, don't ever, ever cry. And I was 12 when I met my stepmother. She's in her 80s now. And um, we're very, very close. And I have never seen her cry. Um, so I think those lessons and that kind of trauma runs very, 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 very deep. So my novel is set. I decided to set it in France. And my character is 12 years old. Um, the war starts. Her father is killed on the streets of Paris uh, in the early days of the occupation after he stands up to a German soldier. And so her mother gets her on a train in the middle of the night, gets her out into the country, and leaves her with um, a Catholic farming family. And she is given a new name and taught the Catholic prayers and is told, if you make a mistake, the police are going to come kill all of us. So initially, she sort of has the attitude, because she's 12, of like, oh, well, this is just like a game of pretend. I've got this. But as the war continues, she realizes she needs to take this much more seriously and really commit to playing this role of this, uh, this Catholic orphan. Um, and by the end of the war, she has lost herself. 
in that new identity. The, the girl she once was sort of disappears and she has fully uh, embraced this false identity to the point of having become a devout Catholic um, and due to the rather brilliant uh, anti-Semitic, fascist, xenophobic propaganda and indoctrination of the Vichy government and the Nazi government, um, she is transformed into an anti-Semitic fascist. So I was really interested in the novel and looking at how that kind of psychological trajectory can happen. So I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs, actually, from very early in the novel. Um, and my character, uh, Danielle, she's Danielle when the war starts. She becomes a different person at the end. Uh, she is remembering the early dates of the occupation with her parents in Paris. Before the Germans marched into Paris last June, everyone acted like the end of the world was on its way, marching across the map. They'd marched all the way up into Denmark and Norway, across to Belgium and right into France, sneaking in through the unlocked back door, sweeping through the Maginot line like brushing off strands of spider silk, slaughtering as they went, our brave men butchered, our women and children chopped to bits. Danielle heard the terrible stories everywhere, people babbling in the cafes, the shops, the cinema lines about what horrors were coming next. Get ready for war. They say it's marching toward us, blood and death marching. The end of our ways, of our pride, our honor, our France, of everything we know. Can't you feel it, the coming end? And she could feel it, the end of everything coming at her, sneaking inside her room at night to pound her chest and beat blood in her fingertips and ears when she tried to sleep, holding the lace curtains and satin coverlet would shield her, hide her, keep the dangerous butchering thing out. Maybe she should say a prayer the way her grandparents always told her to. Please, God, she mumbled into her pillow. Please, God, please, but wasn't sure which words came next. Anyway, it wasn't nice to pray only when you wanted to ask for something. That isn't why God is there, her father always said. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Most of their neighbors fled, and their maid Sophie went home to Geneva, and her parents' friends, who used to come on Shabbat to argue about God and art, who was or was not betraying France, and whether the war was real or just rumor and threat of rôle de guerre, a phony war. Her mother sent Danielle to bed early on those Friday nights, when the arguments were less about French politics and God, and more about Poland and ghettos and the Nazi man in charge of Germany, Hitler. But Danielle listened at the door. You're blind, Paul, she heard them say to her father. Jews and the academics, it's who they always come for first. Jews and academics. But this is our home, her father said. This is our country. We're not running away. And she lay in bed, blood pounding. Are they coming? Would there be blood in gutters? Would the poison gas burn through her curtains to blister her lungs and shred her skin? Rolling tanks, crushing those dogs gone wild in the streets. And shouldn't they flee? But no, her father wanted to stay. And surely he would shield her, keep them all safe. Of course he would, yes. Um, and then there's more description about life under the occupation and some of the difficulties that the populace faced. Um, so I'm jumping ahead again. And Danielle is, is sort of saying, but a lot of things in a way return to normal. And she says, yes. Um, long walks with her father, just like always, um, the two of them together. Papa not caring about her messy braids or her gloves stuffed in her pockets. Walking on slow Sunday afternoons until the sun began its drop, and they'd stop on the Pont Neuf to watch the candles and lamplights twinkle on in the buildings. Watch the colors change, Danielle, he'd say, pointing to the sky. Look how beautiful it is. Look at all the shadings, always changing, from silvery lemon over there to that deep sapphire. Look how it's turning to ink. It's like a painting. We're entre chien et lou at this hour. Now look carefully, and you show me the moment when day changes to night, when the light turns to dark. Can you see it? And she'd look and look, but could never see exactly when the shift happened, when the dog became the wolf. And that didn't change, the twilight sky, just because the Germans were there. I'll stop there. Oh. Oh, thank you both. Is my mic working? Am I good? Okay. So I want to thank you both also for writing a description of this event that wrote my first question for me. <laughs> 
So um, both of the, the characters in both of your books experience loss at very young ages. For Lorraine, um, it, the passage you read, you're 19 when your father passes, but you had experienced loss before that. His first heart attack, I think, was when you were seven. Mm -hmm. So, you know, childhood loss. And then um, Danielle, I think her father, right after, soon after that passage that you read, um, is killed when she's also a young child. And then she continues to experience loss through you know, having to leave her home, having to leave everything she knows about her life, her best friend Claire that she talks about a lot throughout the book. Um, so how do you, did these losses shape who the characters became through the rest of the story? Did we write that question for you? You did. You did. That's what you wrote. <laughs> losses, how the I losses shape their lives. Yeah. Do you want me to go? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so as Laura was saying, her father is killed on the street soon, very soon after, the, after that memory. Um, and after, very soon after that, her mother takes her down to live on this farm. Um, and then her mother disappears. Her mother is going to go underground and try to survive the war. And so Danielle is in grief over the loss of her father, which was, is surreal to her. She was obviously very, very close to her father. Um, and she feels abandoned by her mother. I mean, she's 12. She doesn't really understand that her mother has left her here because it's the safest place for her. Um, so she feels completely uh, abandoned by family. And she's left with these new people who are, you know, she's a rather sophisticated, snobbish little girl. And she's left with these people who are farmers and Catholics. And she's very disdainful of them and finds them ignorant. And, um, and I think something that I didn't realize going into the novel, but in writing the novel, the loss of her father becomes such a significant part of her, of the, the character's arc, because as the story goes on and she has to participate in Catholic ritual and go to mass and go to confession, and eventually she goes to confirmation and she has to uh, profess belief in Jesus Christ, in the Virgin Mary, um, that as she does that, the figure of, of Jesus and, you know, this, this sort of relentless phrase of our father, our father, our father, and the litany of that in all of the prayers. Same thing with our mother, our holy mother, our blessed mother. That, 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 that those experiences of Catholic theology become a source of comfort to her. This feeling that you're, you know, she's told, our, our blessed mother is always, is always with you. Our blessed father is always with you. And this, you know, is a, being told to a girl whose father was just killed and whose mother just abandoned her. And she, she doesn't believe it at the time, but in the course of the story, it gets under her skin. And she does find very legitimate and sincere comfort in the idea that Jesus and the Virgin Mary are there for her, will never leave her, um, love her dearly. And that is a, a very critical part to why she denounces Judaism and embraces Catholicism so passionately is because she, she mm -hmm. finds love and comfort there. Right. So. Mm -hmm. um, since this is a, a memoir, it's a, it's a little more awkward to talk about it in mm -hmm. terms of me, um, but, but the, um, um, my, father had his, my father had polio as a child, and um, he, had, he walked with a limp, he had the elevated shoe on, you know, on one side, and, um, and he had spent <clears throat> a couple of years in the hospital in an iron lung, and um, that... He was grow. He grew up in the um, in the South, and so it was in the '40s when he got polio in 1948, um, to a very evangelical fundamentalist family, and um, he was prayed over, as you might expect. Um, he was prayed over that if this boy is to um, do your work, Lord, then please spare him. If not, please choose another. And that prayer, as you might imagine, got under his skin. The um, conditional love of it, so it's an interesting contrast to what Tara's talking about with the, the unconditional love yeah. of the father and the mother. My father experienced the very conditional love of the evangelical aspect of at least this particular um, part of North Carolina where he was growing up, and he carried that into our family. He always felt like um, something was wrong with him. Illness was a lack of faith on his part, a lack of goodness on his part, a lack of all the things. Right? What have you done if you would just confess something? Um, my grandmother, his mother, would um, 
send books. Hey, this was the era of Billy Graham. Was we were going to find this was you know all of the um, the things to try to help him figure out what it was he did so that he would not be sick. And this was to my eyes harassment and <laughs> and abuse. Um, and also, though, it, um, it trapped me in this, I would lie awake um, after he had his heart attack, so I was seven at that point, and um, worry that he was going to go to hell because there, whatever that was, I just knew there had to be one because apparently everyone was shouting it at me. And so if, and I couldn't, I couldn't bear the thought of this person that I loved so much going to some place like that, and I couldn't reconcile how a parent who supposedly loved their child could speak that way. And those things fundamentally shaped the way I, I feel about religion, the way I, um, um, and then the way I ended up uh, being involved with or not being involved with people in my life because I built up a ginormous wall after he died. And, um, you know, if I didn't know you before he died, no one was getting in after that. And then, um, so when cancer, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was the, I was the same age as, as uh, he was when he died. <clears throat> um, coincidentally, <laughs> I was the exact same age. And, you know, when, you, when, you, when someone dies, you, there's always these moments in your life after that where you... You miss them more, like, uh, you know, like my, he never met my husband, he never saw me graduate from college, he never saw, you know, like all the things, right, all the different milestones. But when that happened, I really wanted to talk to somebody who had spent time being sick. Um, and so that kind of opened up a whole other door to, to relate to him. Mm -hmm. And I felt like one of the things that had to happen to get well from cancer was I had to find a way to forgive my grandmother for that abuse of him. And so a good portion of the speculative part of the book is this, this stage play in this ancestral realm with Raven, Raven's mother, Raven's father, and then I identified myself as just me. So the character, I mean, there are these four characters in this play space, trying to figure out what happened in this family, how this happened, what, um, how can I forgive her so that I can move forward in my life without so much, like really just profound rage that was still holding, it was years and years and years. I mean, it's been, he's been dead 30 some years. Um, and my aunt gave me a book, I mean, a, um, a box of old letters that my grandmother had saved and she had apparently saved every letter my father had ever written. You write to your mother when you're a child of the South. So she had, <laughs> he had written to her every week, dear mother. Right every week, and she had saved them all, and so I had this treasure of these letters, and they didn't say a lot because they were very guarded. Um, there was one from when he was in the hospital in 1976. He could barely write, like a kindergartner. He was under, you know, but he wrote every week. Like he got to come out of my coma now, Bob, to write to you because mother to write to you because if I don't write to you, <laughs> you know, and um, but the very last letter was postmarked the day after he died. So he must have mailed it the day he died or the day prior to his death. So it would have arrived at my grandmother's house after he was already dead. Mm -hmm. And that was a moment that really cracked her open for me. And I imagined, and there's a, a large scene in the book about her receiving this letter after he died. Mm -hmm. And that was a place that allowed me to open up and find forgiveness for her and find a space to, to love her. And that was profoundly transformative for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is kind of related, and so it's about genre, and you know, the, your books do share themes of, mm -hmm. of loss and grief, personal and also societal, um, you know, things that uh, are lost for the whole society, and um, you do it in different genres, obviously, and Lorraine, yours is a memoir, but also incorporates lyric essay, and then you chose to add speculative elements. Um, and then the historical novel. So I'm just interested in why you chose those genres and if you, just, if you went through you know, stages of choosing how to write these, did things change as you were writing? Mm -hmm. 
Let me start. Um, yeah, so I've been working on this book for 25 years. Um, I mean, I was writing other books and doing other things in between uh, times, but it, it's been a 25-year evolution. Um, and again, I, you know, the idea when I met my stepmother and I learned this about her when I was 12, it really planted a seed. And after my first novel was published, I was sort of casting about for what my next project would be. And I, I thought of my stepmother and her history and what she had experienced. And it just, it fascinated me. Um, but when I started working on the story 25 years ago, I was primarily interested in the psychological experience of how you take a vulnerable mind, you take, you know, the mind, a, a, you know, someone who's a child, um, and who's also terrified and terrorized, um, you know, put under circumstances of such enormous pressure and where the stakes are so high and just what that can do to the mind. And then you layer on top of that this sort of false pretend identity. You have to live. You have to embody. And that was the, what drew me to the novel. Of course, it was going to be a historical novel because I, I, it made sense to set it in, not my stepmother's Hungary because I knew nothing about Hungary, um, but to set it in France. Uh, I thought I was, I felt more familiar with French culture. I had lived there for a year and I, I made many trips to France. And I had sort of like, oh, yeah, the Vichy government, they collaborated with the Nazis. OK, well, that'll be interesting. Um, and in the research, I had, I had no idea, not just that they collaborated with the Nazis, but how enthusiastically they collaborated with the Nazis. Um, so the, 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 setting, the, the setting in France became so in, you know, integral to the novel. I mean, I, I can't imagine it being set somewhere else, because France almost takes on a character itself as my character is having this split and transformation of identity, the country of France was undergoing that sort of as well. Um, so I set out, really, I was interested in psychology. And I, about six years ago, I had, I had put it down for a couple of years to write, um, I, I guess, my essay collection. Um, and I picked it up again. And I hadn't looked at it in a couple of years. And I reread it. And I was so shocked. Because um, if you think back six five, six years ago, <laughs> and what was happening in the world, I was so shocked that there are passages in here of people saying things that I was hearing on the nightly news, and I was seeing in headlines. I, you know, the anti-immigrant, xenophobic, xenophobic, fascist mentality, fascist ideology. And I mean, I was just thinking like, oh my god, have we learned nothing? Um, we're, we're reliving it. And so I didn't set out to write a political novel, <laughs> but I realized how political it is. And I think one of the, the things I love about historical fiction, both as a reader but also as a writer, is there's that comfortable distance of history a little bit, where I think it, it's like with comedy. Sometimes you can slip really serious messages in if you're being comedic. And I think with something that is set in a historical era, like, oh, yeah, the Holocaust. That happened 60 years ago. You know, fascists taking over countries. That happened a long time ago. But it, it is illustrating a, something that we are, are experiencing now. But I think that because it is set in a safer past, mm -hmm. it can illuminate very contemporary issues with, 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 that, with a little distance. Where, you know, I mean, like, who really wants to read? about, I mean, we're reading about fascism every day. Um, but like, again, oh yeah, World War II. Um, so I'm hoping that the, 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 what I'm trying to illustrate creeps in and, and sneaks up on the reader. Yeah. It's so interesting how, you know, how that, how something can be so contemporary, mm -hmm. that set so, you know, so far back in the past. And I think, um, you know, with memoir, if you're, if there's not enough distance, you're just writing therapy. Journal entries. You know, you're doing journal entries, you're doing, you know, and all of that is important to do. Um, and so I also started writing this. I remember I, literally, I remember the day after he died, I started writing it. But it was nothing at all like this. It was just, and my, my intention was I wanted to make sure no one forgot him. And so I started and stopped and started and stopped and went to college and went to grad school and got work and went back and like all this stuff. Um, and I never could find the way into telling the parts of his story that I wanted to bring to other people. I didn't have my piece of it yet, you know? Um, and then, you know, memoir is such a, such a slippery genre, you know? Um, and 
you know, and I haven't, I, I, you know, I wasn't a child prisoner of war. I didn't walk across a country with famine. I didn't, like, I don't have an external story that's super compelling. This is a very internal story. And so trying to find a way to dramatize grief brought in the, the conversations with my dad as Raven, with his family, with everything that's, that's in those sections, to the best of my knowledge, were things that happened based off of stories I heard from my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather, the letters, and kind of all of that. But obviously the conceit is an, is an invention. Um, and it was a way for me to tell that truth sideways, you know, to come into it from, um, from a way where I could bring, I wanted to bring the reader into that level of grief in a, where there was literally a curtain going up and a curtain going down so they could escape it. <laughs> you know, they could, they could get in and get out and not get, not get so stuck because part of the journey of the whole story is how stuck I got and moving through that, you know, that stuck place. So, um, so for me, it was the solution to an internal, you know, story, to a way to bring drama, to bring tension, to bring um, a, a more compelling narrative arc um, to a story that I felt was, did have a lot of value, but didn't have the Freytag, you know, or the Aristotle, or the Spiral, or really any of that. It was just like, you know, okay, I was sad. Can That's I talk, compelling. Can I talk, can I talk, can I talk about that a little bit? Because yeah. why do you think like you had to find a way to dramatize grief, yeah. right? Because there was, it wasn't an external story, you need an internal story. Yeah. And with this book, it's a very internal book. And I was worried writing it that it wasn't dramatic enough. Because, you know, we're pretty Nazis. much... <laughs> but no, I mean, there aren't any Nazis in the book. I mean, you know, we're not in the camps. We're in France. We almost never leave this little village that this girl lives in. And I was worried that it was, you know, you, know, you hear a World War II novel and you are expecting paratroopers and, right. and the camps and, you know, the, these huge external things that are happening. But this is a very quiet internal novel that I, I mean, it's sort of like, I, yeah, I was worried it wasn't, it wasn't big enough. Yeah. It wasn't dramatic enough. Yeah. yeah. That's such a writerly worry. <laughs> Isn't it? <Yeah. laughs> it's not enough plot. Um, What's happening? Nothing happened. <laughs> so I've been told that it's time for audience Q&A. So if you are in the audience and you would like to fill out your Q&A, um, I think that someone is going to come around and collect those for anyone who has a question. And then we may also have some questions online. So maybe we want to start with one of those. Testing. Ah, there I am. Okay, cool. This is, this is very strange. My first time, so please bear with me here. I do have a really interesting question, um, and that's actually directed uh, at both of you. And you, Tara, actually read uh, the paragraph oh. earlier. And it goes something like this. Jews and the academics, yeah. it's who they always come for first. Now, since both of you are in education, could you both speak on the current questioning of the value of higher education <laughs> in the United States? <laughs> it's an easy one. Lorraine? <laughs> Not in this institution. <laughs> uh, it's scary. Uh, you know, the, 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 the dismissal of education and learning and this quest for knowledge as elitist. And... Um, you know, this, this, you know, I'm thinking about universities, I'm thinking about banning books, I'm thinking about, you know, any sort of governmental desire to limit knowledge and suppress knowledge and, and make knowledge difficult for people. Um, and so, yeah, whether it's banning books or, you know, for looking at institutions of, of higher learning, I, I, I think that there's a difference between, like, like STEM, you know, the sciences, engineering, computers, math, which I think is granted um, a greater value and I think are con considered more masculine uh, educational pursuits than the humanities. You know, literature, uh, creative writing, language, et cetera, et cetera, which 
um, I think is considered a luxury. And, you know, yeah, people like to read at the beach, but it, it's not really important. And I think that I'm experiencing at ASU, I'm a professor at ASU, a, 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 a difficulty with the institution. I, it's better now, but I think that there has been a history of not taking the humanities mm -hmm. seriously. And, you know, we don't get the funding. We don't get, you know, the whatever. Because, you know, the humanities, what's that? It's, oh boy, it's just about how to create human beings. You know, we don't need that. Nobody needs to learn about that. Nobody needs to teach that. <laughs> So I, I don't know if that answers the question. But. And I think one of the key things, too, is that the humanities and all of its amazing, you know, segments helps you learn how to be with difference. Yeah. Yeah. It helps you learn how to... That, that, that it exists. That, right, that it exists. First of all, yes, that yeah. it exists. That you can remain existing if someone else is different from you. Um, that you can um, have a conflict with someone and not have to cancel or kill them, right? <laughs> that you can, you know, um, the ability to have respectful disagreements is a profound gift of the humanities oh. that is um, greatly lacking mm -hmm. in, the, in the country right now. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think it goes hand in hand mm -hmm. with the, the, the general, like, we're not valued, we're not, this is the... The, the soft fields, the, yeah. you know, like, you know, when, what are you going to do? How are you going to get a job? Where are you going to work? And it's, you know, and, but how are you going to relate? Yeah. Right? How are you going to relate? And it's, a, it's, it makes me angry most every day. Yeah. And book banning came up at our last event as well, oh, I think, it. because, you know, yeah. people that watch these care about books. So, yeah, I mean, and that's a big part of why book banning is so scary, right? Because for a lot of children, a lot of young people, that is how you experience mm -hmm. um, difference, experience different cultures, people who are different in your own culture. Right. Thank you very much. So the next question is from an audience member, Naomi, um, and it's for Tara. Is there a certain author or person that inspired you to write, and how or how? Why or how did that person or thing inspire you? Oh my God, where to start? Um, I, I will say that I was just very fortunate. I had uh, my mother and father were both readers and loved reading and books everywhere all over the house and encouraged me as a reader. And you know, I started going to the public library by myself on the bus when I was probably 11 or 12 years old. And you know, the smell of books, the escape into books, I mean, I. I um, it was supported, it was encouraged. Um, my being a writer was supported, I mean, I feel very fortunate, supported, encouraged, like they didn't care less that I wasn't gonna give them grandchildren, but when am I gonna finish the next book? Like that was the pressure my parents put on me. Um, so I, I just, it was part of my life from a very early age was, you know, books are a part of life. And, you I know, agree. Yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have from the audience is for Lorraine. Um, what or who helped you grieve the loss of your dad? Um, the, the, a woman named Delana Watson is, um, she's a, a therapist that does um, a, a Jungian method of music therapy, of um, guided imagery work. And um, when I was in my graduate program for psychology, she was um, we were actually in the program together, and so I got to work with her. We got to practice on each other, <laughs> and so she was learning her stuff, and I was learning my stuff. And I met her in a um, in a group, you know, a group workshop, and she was doing this method, and um, it was the very. And I had tried therapy before, so at this point, I went. I was in this program in my mid thirties, and I started trying therapy at like twenty twenty one, and didn't did not work for me. Um, it mostly didn't work for me because I was not going to tell anybody anything. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems to be a key part of it, but with the <laughs> but with the, the this music therapy, it was all image based, and you didn't have to tell anybody anything. And so, because my imagination is is really one of my greatest strengths, it, it was a nice pairing with that. And in like ten minutes, I got to a place that I had not previously. I didn't even know was possible to access, and I've been working with her so since 2003. Um, now that she's even out of network, I still track her down. You know, it was, it was like, it was so worth, worth working with her and what she 
allowed me to find within myself to feel. So certainly there have been other people, but that was the, that was the, pivotal, the pivotal one. Great, thank you. So the next question is from Sue in the audience. Um, what was your relationship like with your parents and your religion? <laughs> Except for everyone? Mine's the easy answer. Um, my father was Lutheran, my mother's Jewish, was Jewish, so I, technically that makes me Jewish. Um, to abs total secular, non-religious, devout atheists, no religion whatsoever, but I, I feel culturally Jewish because my maternal grandparents I was very close to. And while they were not very, you know, they weren't really strongly observant Jews, they didn't go to synagogue, you know, we did Passover at their house. And um, so I, I felt a sense of Jewish heritage from my maternal grandparents, but it, it's never been religious. It's, it's always been more of a cultural identification. So how was that writing a book that is so much, I mean, not about religion, but yeah. relies on religion as I, part of the plot? I, I mean, I had to do so much research for this book. <laughs> one of the, I, I had to research Judaism because I, you know, I'm a bad Jew. I know very little about my Jewish history. <laughs> I knew about World War II, the whole, you know, I, of course I knew about that, but, um, I, I had to do a really deep dive into Judaism and a very deep dive into Catholicism. And I had to learn the, the beauty and the power of each faith in order to treat them with respect. But also, you know, I'm, I, it's, it's very clear on, in this era how religion is used, you know, as a tool of control. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I learned a lot about religion. <laughs> I am profoundly traumatized by religion. Um, to, still to this day, my mother was a, or she's alive, my mother is a Lutheran, um, and so and she, she was just fine. <laughs> she's always fine. That's, she's a fine person. Um, she's a Lutheran, and she, um, um, you know, anytime I'll bring up something about religion, she's like, well, my God doesn't believe that. Like, her God is the one that loves everything and does everything, and, like, it's not, that's not her God. Her God is not the evangelical God. So my father's God was this evangelical God, and he, you know, ran from that. We, we literally ran away from North Carolina. We ended up in Arizona trying to outrun my grandmother and his family and, you know, get away from that. And so um, he never, you know, when you get that early, you just can't shake it. You know, it's really hard, it's really hard to shake. Um, and he always felt, I, be, I believe he always felt, um, a shame in his very core. So that, to me, got very associated as well with religion. And, and when, I, when I look at Christianity and I look at, you know, all the conditions to be allowed to, like, get to be born again or whatever, it's like, that's a bunch of baloney. Um, and it just does not make any sense to me. I saw how it caused so much suffering, so much pain, um, so much disconnection from the self. Um, and so, so I also, I mean, I don't have any idea. I, I don't have any idea. But I can tell you every time I, I hear like a, a gospel song, I cry. And I want to crawl up to the altar and say I'm sorry. To this day. And then I get angry that that's still in me to this day. And then Elvis sings a gospel song and I cry. So it goes, it's like, it's this back and forth and, and, and back and forth. And I don't know that um, when, I'm a, when I'm around people, and I don't know many who, who did not grow up with some kind of religion, I can see how clear their mind is around this. And I'm envious of it. Because mine is still very cloudy with it as much as I try to... Like, ugh. but it, it's, it's still there. Thank you. So we have one more here. Could you speak, and this is for both of you, could you speak on the differences, if any, on how grief impacts the young adult versus, wait, the young versus the adults? Sorry. I did a dissertation on that. So I'll, I'll keep it, but I'll keep it short. I did. I did. My, I, my, focus, my research focus was on the impact of father loss on adolescent girls. Um, and I was curious as to whether or not that was a different, a different experience than when you lose a parent when you're, when you're older. And, you know, because that was my issue. And, of course, duh, yes, there is a difference. 
And um, the difference primarily has to do with your stage of development as a child, um, what you, and how you come to shape who you are. So when you lose um, uh, the opposite gender parent, you, one of the things that you lose is how to move into your own gender. Um, when you lose the same gender parent, you're losing what you're rebelling against. And, um, and it's, you know, there's much more, more to it than that, but there are very definitely um, different impacts at different stages of, you know, of your life. My sister was 15, um, and I was 19, and certainly she was impacted by it, but she also um, wasn't already with one foot out the door. So I had one foot out the door going to college, and, and it brought me back. So it stopped my, you know, I couldn't have fun in college. I couldn't do, like, all the stuff I thought you were... Like, I've never had it, I was never young. I never felt like I've ever been young. Um, because that was always a part of, of you know, going on. Uh, I, I don't know what I, I can add to that. Um, I mean, the, the, some of the thoughts that, cr that are crossing my mind is, um, if we're talking sort of to lose a parent, mm -hmm. um, I can focus on that. Yeah. As a child, you know, at that point your childhood ends to some degree, um, and you have to learn how to parent yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think every child has very different resources and tools by which to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that when you lose a parent as an adult, which I have, you, you sort of go in the opposite direction. I think like as a child, you have to parent yourself and, and it, it sort of shoves you into a kind of, a, like dealing with a kind of maturity. Whereas if you're with the adult, I think it can very often push you back into a, a sort of childlike feeling. I, I mean, I think, is any, anybody here watch Succession? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, when, you know, well, uh, you know, the three adult children all react very differently. And um, the oldest one is like, goes into like, okay, call this person and do this. And um, the middle one, who's the daughter, um, becomes very childlike and, and refers to her father as daddy. And this is the father she was estranged from. Um, and the youngest son, who's, you know, 30, 35, he's in absolute denial. Like, he can't accept that his father has died. So I actually, one of the things I love about that show is to, it illustrates that no adult is going to have the same experience right. of, of, parent, of losing a parent, nor will this, any child have the same experience. And since she brought in pop culture. Too. Sorry? They, they, you forgot the eldest child, too. Oh, yeah, everyone forgets Connor. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she forgot Connor. <laughs> Sorry, Connor. And since she brought pop culture in. That was very, that was very meta. <laughs> Just yeah. Since she brought pop culture in, the other show, This Is Us, okay. is a, just a profoundly beautiful study of the grief of a father on a family. Um, it's the impact on three children who are twins, or uh, they're all the same age, two are twins, and anyway, same age. Um, very different reactions and responses to the sudden death of their father by a heart attack. Um, the show ran for, I think, six, six seasons. It was, it was one of the most moving shows on grief I've ever seen. All right, more questions here. From Lillianne in the audience, um, for Lorraine. What pushed you to publish your first book? What pushed me to publish my first book? This is my question, and it's more so saying, like, what was the thing that made you actually put it out there, the mm -hmm. final action of it being out to the book? Do you mean... The agent and the publisher, do you mean that piece? Or the writing yeah. of it? But the decision of, okay, I'm going to give this to the public. The public's going to see this. Yeah. Oh, so that's, even okay. even before you go through a publisher, but the mm -hmm. final decision of who mm -hmm. the public's going to see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I ever wanted. Mm. So it wasn't like a moment at, at the time. It was like I knew that one of the things I wanted to do in life was to write a write a. I only had a one book goal, like write a book. I wanted to be the youngest writer to ever do it, and then I found out someone did it at like eight, and I got really angry. I was like 10. <laughs> like, uh, my goal is thwarted. I will never, <laughs> never be a writer. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it, so my, my first book was based off my, my dissertation on lost fathers, so that went through Hazelden. So it was like, a lot of it was done. It was done in a more academic way, and I, I retooled it for that. And I, we thought, I think that was just the first step. Just. Was it different with the memoir than it was with your other books? The decision to, to publish and share it? Yes, this, this was 
if this is the last thing I write because I'm going to be dead, I'm going to put everything in it that I have. I'm going to say everything that I have never said, and I'm going to put it in this book, and it's sold. I didn't have to try. I have always had to try. Everyone has to try. Like, it's the, this one, it was, and I put everything in it. I, and I don't mean like in a, I pared it down. But I kept everything. <laughs> it's not that long. It's not that long. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 70, that's what I put, I, I didn't hide. And I didn't try to write to the market. And those were two things I did differently from any of the books before. Thank you. So unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, and that is from Keith, and that's again for both of you, tough audience today. Um, what projects are you currently well, well, incubating right now? I'm tired. I don't want to write another novel. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to? Uh, I can't imagine writing another novel right now. I mean, I'm, I'm a little spent. But um, yeah, I'm working on a new collection of short stories. So. That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm working on a book called Sisu about my mother's family. My mother's family is Finnish. Um, and it is also going to be a speculative memoir because that's the most fun form ever. Um, and um, right now I'm working on the voice of my maternal grandmother who I um, barely knew. She was an alcoholic. Um, and she was not allowed to visit us because she could not not drink. So my dad wouldn't let her in the house. And um, she never told my mom she loved her. Um, she never, you know, all the things. When she was sick and she, she died um, alone in New Mexico, her stone just has her dates on it. Um, I, you know, the whole, the, this whole sort of thing. But in the 1920s, she won the Publishers Clearinghouse Sweepstakes and she went on a cruise. And I have all of these... Um, fun pictures of her being happy before she got married, before she, <laughs> <laughs> before she got married, not the correlation and causation, I, I before, they, before she got married, before she had children, um, before she moved to New York. Um, and when, um, my mom is a mathematician, and so very different, and when, um, when I would tell her about kind of seeing things, hearing voices, doing all the, the weird woo-woo stuff that I do, she, would, she had this throwaway line, and she's like, my mother used to see things. And I never forgot that. And it was like, and I've been trying to write that book for a long time, too. I've been trying, like, well, I wonder what she was medicating. Well, she fled, you know, she fled Finland during you know, World War II, who's not kind to of Finland. You know, she, you know, all of that was, was kind of going on. So I've just been haunted by her for a very long time, and I do not know her. So I'm trying to get all I can while anyone is left alive and, um, and try to find that out, because I feel like that maternal, you know, that, that maternal line is, a, is the next question for me. Can you tell us what Sisu means? Sisu is untranslatable because it's Finnish. Um, it's a, it is, they say it's untranslatable in English, but it's a Finnish word that um, means a fortitude to just continue on. So it's a little bit more than resilience. It's like, it's more than, the, the metaphor that my mom told me was, um, Sisu means you know the bear is at the door and you open the door anyway. I said, okay. It is the name of one of my cats. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Laura. Marek. Thank you. I was about to clap into the mic, and then I realized how booming it oh, would sorry. end up being. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you all. It's like, again, uh, for coming to an evening with Tara Eisen and Lorraine Herring. And just one more round of applause for both of them and also our amazing hostess, Laura Klein. Thank you for joining us for the Literary Southwest event, An Evening with Tara Eisen and Lorraine Herring, held here at the Boyd Tenney Library at Yavapai College. 
please click on the survey linked in the description below in order to tell us your thoughts on how the event went. Go to the Literary Southwest website in order to sign up for our e-newsletter to receive updates on future author talks and to find out how you can continue to support one of Northern Arizona's longest-running literary events. Have a wonderful evening and happy reading.